Welcome everyone to Nap Time. Uh, we are here live again from our very fancy studios. Hi, Layla. <laughs> Hi, um, how are you? Good, good. So we are here uh, with Layla Bermeo, who is the Kristen and Roger Servison Associate Curator of American Paintings at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. Um, she's organized exhibitions, including the innovative Frida Kahlo and the Arte Popular, and uh, collecting stories, Native American art. Um, and she has a great dissertation uh, in art history on the U.S.-Mexican War, and that includes a lot of maps and uh, other amazing objects like Comanche's Indian uh, shields. Um, the yeah, and so for those of us, those of you that that are here that haven't haven't joined us before, this is map time, and we uh, get all sorts of people on here to talk uh, all things cool maps. Um, I'm Dave Weimer. I work at the Harvard Map Collection. And this is co co sponsored with the Norman B. Leventhal Map and Education Center uh, at the Boston Public Library. So, uh, Layla, uh, let's let's talk about this statue. Um, let's talk about it. So, I just so, want to say thank you so much, Dave, for uh, for the invitation. I'm uh, always really interested in what I can learn from uh, map curators and librarians. And just want to emphasize that I am not a scholar of maps or cartography. And so in a lot of my work, um, as you mentioned in my dissertation, which includes a chapter just on maps, I'm really looking at them more as uh, drawings and prints. And so that is some of what we can talk about. Um, this object is a strange one. So we can just start with exactly what are we looking at here? Yeah. Oh, um, and I should, I should mention that uh, you can view all the stuff we were looking at at tinyurl.com uh, slash Bermeo. And that, that link is, is pinned right there in the chat. Um, so yeah, and there's a great, it's a great overview of different objects. Um, but we thought we would start with this one. So we're looking at a detail of a plaster sculpture by a German sculptor named Elizabeth Ney. Um, who moved to Austin, Texas in the 1880s. And so this is a uh, retrospective kind of look at someone who was already a historical figure at the time, Stephen F. Austin, who lived during the first part of the 19th century. Um, he was the first person to successfully create a colony of white settlers in Texas in the 1820s. And he settled Texas, notably not for the United States, but at the time for Mexico. So if we go to the next slide, just really quickly, Dave, um, which shows the full version of the sculpture. Yeah, I, uh, I'm just, I'm gonna uh, leave this one up. It doesn't come up as well on the, uh, on the phone, but um, you can just describe it and people can Okay, perfect. The, so yeah. this is, um, again, this is a, a zoomed in detail um, of a, a full, of like actually a life-size um, sculpture. And there is a marble version of it. There are actually multiple versions of this sculpture. There's one in the Texas Capitol, um, but there's also one at the National Statuary Hall collection in Washington, D.C., which is a collection of over a hundred um, statues of people who are considered to be important figures of American history. I think of all of those sculptures, Austin might actually be the only one who is holding a map. Um, and not everyone actually knows that he's holding a map. Um, it's often described as a scroll, and that is because on the marble versions, and actually even in the very first plaster version that Ney made based off of her original clay sculpture, you can't actually see the map. For some reason, this uh, version that's in the Briscoe's collection is the only one where the map is delineated on. And it remains kind of a mystery when the map got there and who did it, um, which if it is a piece of vandalism, it is like the most scholarly kind of vandalism that anyone has ever seen. Um, it's very appropriate that Austin would have been represented with a map because he was, as we'll discuss, a very important map maker. It's a lesser known part of his reputation, but it is something that the sculptor would have known. Um, she thoroughly researched her subjects and she reached out to Austin's relatives to receive photographs of him to work from, to gather his personal items. So the, the Kentucky Long Rifle, 
that is sort of cradled in his arm probably was his actual rifle. Um, I haven't been able to confirm if this was an example of a map that was given to the sculptor, but it's possible because as we will see, Austin made so many maps. Um, so if we can look at the detail again, Dave, um, it's a little unclear exactly what this map shows, but what is significant about it is that it is definitely the interior of Texas, um, which had really gone unmapped in Western styles since Spanish colonization of the Americas. Uh, many of you will know that the seat of the Spanish empire was in Mexico City. And so uh, Texas was considered to be very, very far away from the capital in the kind of northern region of the empire. And there were far fewer colonists or representatives of the government there. Um, this begins to change a little bit uh, with Mexican independence in 1821 and with the entrance of Stephen F. Austin into Texas. So on the far left there, it's hard to see, but we can see some lettering that says, Gulf of Mexico. And what that means is that everything to the right would represent the interior of Texas. So the landmarks and the kind of visual language of this map, they do loosely resemble those on other maps that we see that Austin made um, from the period. So um, I was thinking about uh, this example from the Library of Congress, um, which is this kind of beautiful watercolor example. And um, we can see, again, this is a different orientation, but the Gulf of Mexico is sort of compressed on one side. And then the strongest lines um, are those that represent rivers, of course, lines that are very important to um, trade and to travel in the area. These rivers are kind of crisscrossed uh, by roads that are both in solid and dotted lines. In particular, dotted lines usually represent the historic roots of indigenous peoples, such as the Comanche people or the Lipan Apache people. Um, and that's also another interest of mine um, that uh, sort of informs the work of my dissertation. How did map makers like Austin, who were working in Western styles, try to kind of track or freeze um, the pathways of peoples, of indigenous peoples who had a very different understanding um, of the land than they did. This map also um, reminds me of another map that I actually know a little bit better, um, which is one in the Briscoe's collection. So another one from 1822, um, also done in watercolor. And in this one, we can actually see sort of right there in the middle um, between these like thickly delineated rivers, the Colorado and the Brazos River, marked um, is where Austin's original colony was. Um, he based this map on uh, an 18th century Spanish map that was just of the coastline. And then he tried to sort of add in what the interior would look like. And he used a version of this map um, when he went to Mexico City to petition for the right to settle this area. Austin and all of the people that he brought in um, to the colony had to pledge to become Mexican citizens and to learn Spanish. And also as part of that deal, Austin promised to create the most complete map of the interior of Texas possible. And that is exactly what he did. So as an art historian, what's interesting to me about Austin is that he was not a cartographer. Um, he uh, had no experience map making before beginning to settle Texas. Um, and he kind of begins this monumental task just simply by looking um, and trying to draw what he sees and by copying um, what few extant examples there were in what at the time would have been northern Spain. So uh, northern New Spain. So many of you are probably um, familiar with uh, Alexander von Humboldt's 1803 map of the Americas. Zebulon Pike also, um, when he was exploring the Louisiana Purchase, um, had been captured by Spain at the turn of the 19th century and essentially marched all the way um, from Colorado to what is now northern Mexico in Chihuahua. Um, he wrote up a report and created a map, and these were examples that, um, that Austin would have worked from. What we see in Austin's map, especially these early maps, is a lot more attention paid to where indigenous peoples are and how they are moving around. Um, and we can see that on a couple of other examples. His earliest examples, so Dave, if we can see the one that's just the line. Um, I love these very, very early examples of Austin's maps, um, where here we just see a waterway that is perhaps intersecting with another creek 
um, and sort of spread across multiple sheets of paper as though he's sort of walking and mapping at the same time. Um, eventually, he would hire a surveyor, one of the colonists who joined him, uh, Nicholas Ryder, was a surveyor. And so the maps become more and more sophisticated over time. Um, so we can see in the next example how they kind of grow. Um, this is one from the uh, collection of the Beinecke at Yale. And what is wonderful, go on their website, you can zoom in and out um, of this map and see that it was made explicitly um, to try to kind of track where Comanche people were moving around in this area. Um, Comanche people have everything to do with, um, with uh, Austin's life in this, um, in this moment, in this area. And um, one of the reasons that he was allowed by the Mexican government to settle there was explicitly because the Mexican government was trying to protect themselves um, from these sovereign groups um, like the Comanches, like the Lipan Apaches, um, essentially trying to make a, what I would call a human shield of white people um, between them and these uh, indigenous groups who were very powerful at the, at the time. And so Austin is constantly trying to um, represent these groups that are, again, moving around and kind of rejecting um, what would have been Western styles of, of map making at the time. Um, he begins to exchange information with officials from the Mexican government around this time. So this is like the mid um, edging into the later 1820s. Um, and if we show the next example, um, we can see that he's making lots of notations um, on these and kind of developing a language for describing this landscape. Um, he eventually winds up crediting um, other Mexican uh, members of the government who are similarly beginning to explore this region um, in the in the years after independence. The goal for Austin, and I think honestly, even for the Mexican government at the time, was to have this map published. And that um, is another interest of mine that informs the dissertation work that the handling of um, cartographic information during the Spanish colonial period was so different after Mexican independence. Um, Spain thought that they would better protect their land by either not completely mapping it or when they did map it by keeping those maps secret. So and circulating them so other people could have the information, they believed that the surest way to protect um, against enroachment on their land was to um, kind of hold all of the information very close. Jealously guarded is usually the, the language that we see in descriptions of Spain. Um, and uh, while I don't think that's quite true, it is, it is an interesting tactic that is different from the way that Mexico and the way that people in the United States would approach mapping, which would be to print them and to circulate them as widely as possible to, in fact, accomplish the same thing, to show ownership of this land. And so uh, Austin always knew he wanted to publish the map. He initially wanted to publish it with the Mexican government. When he finally completed it, he sent it to them, but they did not have the resources at the time to print it. And so around 1829, when it was completed, he also shared it with Henry S. Tanner, who was a very well-known map and atlas printer based in Philadelphia. And Tanner prints um, in 1830, the very first version of, of Austin's map. It was printed as a pop, which tells us a lot. Um, and I know Dave knows a lot about uh, pocket maps, but pocket maps could um, were created in sections that could all be folded into a little book. Um, and I think we have an image of that as well. So we can kind of see how it, a, a big map would have been compressed into something with hard covers to protect it. Um, these maps were specifically meant to be portable. Um, and to sort of, I think, evoke portability or evoke travel. Um, and so it was created explicitly with the goal of attracting more travel, more immigration to Texas, and that is exactly what it did. So in the years after 1830, after the publication of this map, settlers from the U.S. flood Texas, and the Mexican government grows increasingly concerned um, with the ways that these new immigrants might be exploiting the nation's resources, with the ways that Citizenship. Um, all of this sounds deeply ironic now, um, especially considering the, the part of 
um, the landscape that we're discussing. And so, um, of course, by 1835, there are essentially enough um, white settlers to launch the Texas Revolution. And the Republic of Texas becomes independent um, from Mexico. Um, it would be another 10 years before Texas becomes part of the United States uh, during the around the time just before the US-Mexican War. Um, and in those 10 years, and even beyond, there are multiple revisions and reprintings of Austin's map, including one that I think is in the collection of Harvard from 1834. Um, uh, this is my, is this the version, Dave, or is this a slightly later? Uh, this is a slightly later one from um, slightly later version. Yeah. Which just honestly just attests to how yeah. many of, the, of, of these examples there are. Basically every map library has at least um, one version of this map. And um, Honestly, it was well into the late 19th century, and my understanding is that even beyond that, Austin's map was still considered to be the most accurate and the model for other maps of Texas and this region um, in what would have been the southwest of the United States, but the north of Mexico. It is impossible, I think, to overemphasize the significance of this map um, and the movement that it drew into Texas that straight up led to different wars between groups, not only of settlers and of nations, but also between the indigenous nations that were already in that area um, and the kind of um, shifts to the physical landscape that also became shifts in a national landscape. So I'm going to stop there, and um, I hope that we can have more discussion about uh, all of these images and, and issues that we've raised. Yeah. Um, you know, it's fascinating. Uh, the, you know, I'm curious what, what you think the, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about, about monuments these days. Uh, and I guess I'm curious what you think this is a monument to, and like how uh, particularly how what kind of role the map plays in that in that uh, kind of remembrance that's happening particularly you know if we think about as you're saying Austin as a um, as an employee or kind of as he's working for the Mexican government rather than say the U.S. government or even kind of an independent group that is such a good question and I can't believe I like didn't anticipate it at all even though like oh, we talk about our monuments so a couple of things that I think are complicated about Austin I think with the with the discussion of monuments and I would say especially the kind of um, reconsiderations of the framers um, of the Constitution you know take like a, a challenging character like Thomas Jefferson um, I'm actually thinking a lot about how the founding fathers or the framers should probably not only be from the East Coast colonies, um, because this is also a story of revolution that Austin was a part of that led ultimately to an enormous part of the United States becoming becoming the United States, essentially, to an enormous part of a landscape becoming the United States. Um, and in those, when I think about that issue, often I actually think about uh, Mexican leaders from the period who were very much a part of Texas independence and then part of the um, advocacy for Texas to become part of the US. Like how come none of those guys are considered to be founding fathers, none of those Mexican guys. Um, so I think, you know, like, I think a lot about how f there are so fewer monuments to um, other geographically to other parts of the um, history of the making of America. Someone like Austin, I think, is is really an ideal figure to zero in on because his the story of his life, which wasn't very long, he died in 1836, um, is so telling, actually, I think, about early America, where he was, um, I think, lived much of his early life in Sp what was Spanish Missouri, um, he is an American citizen for part of the time, but then he's a Mexican citizen and then he dies as a citizen of the Republic of Texas. And so I think, honestly, we have more to learn from a, a historical figure like him than we do from many of the historical figures who have been held up. Mm -hmm. The um, the map making as such an important process of um, of like colonizing a landscape of settling a landscape um, 
is also something that, you know, I, I wonder why maps aren't more visible, in fact, in, um, in a lot of these discussions about monuments, like why they couldn't also be considered um, a form of monument, even though they're not as sort of stable, but the fact that they could be so influential um, and have so much information about, again, the sort of transformation of the North American landscape of a large part of it into the US, um, you know, and because they can also be so problematic, the same way that other monuments are, right? Um, the way that they are used as like tools of colonization um, in a way that is actually very similar to, to the ways that monuments are, and to sort of like secure histories um, and dominance that quite frankly was often like not completely true. Um, so I think it's interesting for me, it's like the, the perfect melding of like a historical figure like Austin um, with a map also as um, something that communicates uh, like information about America's history, like it seems very fitting. What is um, interesting to me is that there still today is a lot of controversy about whether or not Austin is a fitting uh, person to honor in Texas because he was very different. Um, he had a very different way of working from say either like a military leader um, or someone like Sam Houston, who had like a much more bombastic personality. And when Elizabeth Ney made this sculpture, it was for the, it was intended for the 1890 World's Fair, and she was commissioned to make one of Houston and one of Austin. Everybody could understand making Houston. Not everybody could get behind making Austin. And what we learned from that is that people saw, specifically, they saw like the map as like weak at that point. Mm -hmm. Like they, he, the gun um, I've noted before is sort of like lazily like cradled like in his arm. Um, he doesn't look like a war leader. And this is something that people in Texas are still grappling with, are still like arguing that he was like a strong enough representative of Texas. He worked differently. He was like a sensitive soul or like a kind of scholarly person. Um, but, you know, I would argue that like the map is just as violent as the gun, mm -hmm. right? And like the same issues that we talk about with monuments should absolutely be included with um, with these historical figures that are not as obvious as someone like Thomas Jefferson, that are not sort of, you know, so tied to one part of our own nation's geography and founding story. Mm -hmm. um, no, that's really interesting. And I think that the, uh, the idea of a kind of international story of the founding uh, founding people uh, is a you know is an interesting perspective on on how to get to that that story of the U.S. Um, the along we have one question that came in that has to do with uh, the Comanche and the other kind of American Indian tribes there and um, you know so one is what is you know what's the relationship between the Comanche and some of these other um, tribes and you know the end of not to mention the Mexican uh, government but also like what how does how does that change you know is it similar to the story of the um, you know the what happens in the northeast where um, when there's a conflict between uh, the French and the English, the kind of indigenous people are able to secure more power because they can play mm -hmm. them off one another. But once the French leave, um, they it's much a much harder uh, fight for them. And I guess I'm curious what the you know what so cause part of what you're saying is that if you have these kind of this block uh, defensive barrier of white <laughs> settlers, it's one thing. But then what happens? after say after the US Mexican War and kind of how the how are the indigenous people involved in that story? Um so the the main or one of the important historians on this is Brian DeLay, who um is at Berkeley, I believe, and he's written quite extensively. Um that was actually what inspired my dissertation was that uh I read a book for Walter Johnson's class called War of a Thousand Deserts. And it was about the US Mexican War, but interestingly it uh, was not about the US or Mexico. It was about mostly about the Comanche people and other um, sovereign indigenous groups in the area, which um, told me a lot about uh, the way that wars are kind of named as binaries, but often they are not. And 
arguably this is one of the most international conflicts, even though in our history it has not lived on as such. But it was international, especially because it involved multiple indigenous nations. The Comanche um, loom very large, specifically in the archives of settlers like Austin. That tends to be the sort of main group that they focus in on. And part of that is because at the time, around the time when um, Austin was beginning to settle that area and sort of building up to um, the uh, to the U.S.-Mexican War and to um, the kind of issues with Texas in between. Um, the Comanches are an incredibly powerful group. So they're an incredibly we wealthy group. They're an incredibly sovereign group of people um, who some historians have written actually have um, their own kind of form of colonialist action, although it's not the same as like in a sort of Western colonial way. Um, in general, it's interesting, like indigenous Americans, when they wage war or attack other groups of people, it is rarely to... In, as like an act of genocide, like it is rarely to completely wipe out other groups. Um, it is often instead to dominate them through like wealth, through the sort of like giving of um, of gifts or sort of like taxing or um, in the case of the Comanches, there has been a lot written about how um, because their diets consisted mostly of meat, they were often working, um, like trading with other groups to get different types of food, to get different types of like carb rich food. Um, so they are um, in this moment, an incredibly powerful nation that um, really spreads all the way from what is basically Oklahoma into Northern Mexico with an enormous network of um, different like rancherias or kind of like groups um, of people that interact, intermarry um, with both other native groups and also um, with Mexicans that are in that area. I would say in general in the history of like Spanish colonization is a lot more porous than it is in New England. So in New England, um, it's a very different history where people are native people tend to be like pushed into like praying towns like here in Massachusetts. And it's a lot more integrated in Spanish America. And so we see a group like the Comanches, like absolutely like, you know, not the stereotype of a kind of like lone like Indian band, but like very much interacting um, through trade, um, through political alliances, through marriages, um, with all of these other groups. And that was the concern, honestly, the fact that they were so sovereign and had so much um, control over the landscape and its resources. Um, they are well known for having, for example, an immense control over horses. Um, if you needed to get a horse in that time period, usually you had to go to a Comanche person to get it or a, tr a middleman. Um, but, uh, so that was really the concern that they, that they were really sort of, um, had an ownership of the land, um, but with a very different form of government than what would come from the U.S. And mm -hmm. that is part of the reason why they become the focus of settlers, because they are the biggest threat, in fact. Um, and DeLay's book is all about how the, um, the sort of, uh, conflicts between the Comanche and between the Mexican government make it quite easy, in fact, for the United States to win that war. Mm -hmm. um, and so in that way, they are kind of directly involved. But it is, I think it's helpful to think about um, how many different groups that the Comanches would have been interacting with at the time. And that is part of what makes them so visible on these maps, because mm -hmm. they are sort of... Um, networked in a web as opposed to um, settled in like one area. Yeah. Does that um, answer your question? Yeah, no, I think so. Okay. Uh, the, <laughs> the shifting just a little bit because we were running out of time, but um, the one other question I had that uh, is, you know, a statue like this could, there's a world in which it could end up at somewhere like the MFA, right? Um, it's never gonna end up in a map library uh, mm. And so I'm curious what kind of objects or things you encounter in the museum that are in this liminal space between kind of like a, a non-map artistic object and like an art object that's doing some kind of work with maps. Uh, you know, I think of there, you know, there's work that like has maps in it. Like, you know, I think about like 
like your Xiaomi's Flexus work or mm-hmm. you know, Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns both have stuff that either incorporates maps in them or kind of takes the form of map. But I guess I'm just curious what, you know, working in a museum, how, what, if you, if you encounter objects that you feel like are doing the work of maps um, that, and how, you know, how, how you think about some of these artworks um, having worked with and studied some of these maps and where, where that, where that ends up landing with, with objects in the museum. Yeah, I mean, so the first thing that comes to mind is that in our collection at the MFA, we have a remarkable um, Spanish colonial desk from Puebla that opens up like wonderfully with these doors and the inside of the the doors to this cabinet are um, painted with a map. Um, This object was probably made by both it's made definitely by multiple hands, some of whom are were definitely indigenous Mexican artists um, who are bringing this kind of knowledge um, of, of art making and of painting to this extremely Western object, to um, a, a large desk that is very much in a kind of, like based off of a European model. Um, so we do have objects like that where a map is kind of subsumed into this larger, um, extremely lab. Um, And I don't think that we maybe concentrate enough on how it is still speaking about mapping, if that makes sense. Like, I think Mm -hmm. it, um, the the map becomes like kind of secondary um, to the rest of the, the art object. When in fact, like for whoever owned that object originally, it was probably very much also a map. Um, so probably very much engaged with the kind of landscape that was represented there. And this is an object that's very um, tied to uh, global trade at the time. Um, and, you know, the map is very much a part of that. So um, I don't know, I, I hesitate a lot, honestly, when art historians like myself talk about maps, because we tend to sort of collapse it with the way that we study landscape. And I think there are notable differences between the ways in which artists represent landscapes and the ways in which cartographers make maps. Um, There are overlaps, as we've discussed, in terms of like histories of colonization and the kind of outcomes. Um, But I do think there is, I, I, I guess the answer is that I feel like we should consult more uh scholars of cartography in museums because we probably do have even more objects um in which you know now these are painted objects or now these are decorative arts objects and we've collected them as such but probably at the time they were functioning a lot more um like maps um Mm -hmm. this particular object at the briscoe is very strange (laughs) um i'm not sure again exactly like if it is a copy of an actual map that is in their collection or in one of the other collections in texas because there are so many um Mm -hmm. that he made um but i think it is doubtless that it it was very much meant to give some kind of information about texas Mm -hmm. as much as the sculpture was at the time yeah um no i think that you know i and i i think that's interesting i think that the you know there's one thing i constantly try to uh encourage people that come to our collection to think about is the the porousness between the kind of scientific part of the map and the artistic part of the map and that um Mm. that you know you can't really treat maps without thinking about them as art objects uh in the same way you can't think about them without thinking about their kind of scientific aspects and so um the and that just gets even murkier when it's embedded in some kind of um more Kind of traditional art object you know there's also like the frescoes the uh, the i don't know if they're frescoes but they're the basically the painted walls at the vatican in the mm-hmm. map gallery like so they're they're maps but they're also you know wall paintings um so you know right and at which, the same time someone had to make that map that they were exactly, based off of and exactly. that information is like still there somehow yeah um so they they still you know, like, you know, like you had, like, the 
you know, Russian, like the thing I'm thinking about is like Rauschenberg's Mother of God, which is, is this collage of Rand McNally maps that he kind of howl, hollows out the middle of. But, you know, you could, there's still maps, like there's still, uh, <laughs> like you could still conceivably use that artwork to get around St. Louis or get around Boston. Right, because... exactly. And this map, this Austin map does look exactly like the ones yeah. he was making at the time, which served yeah. a very different purpose. But it's still, I mean, tech, it's still very much like, you know, like represents the knowledge that he was building at the time, which was cartographic yeah. knowledge. Yeah. Um, he would not have imagined that this would have become part of a sculpture. And so, no. you know, I think that's still, still important. Yeah. Um, great. Well, uh, we will continue talking uh, about all things maps and art. But um, this has been really great. I'm glad uh, it's been good to chat. Um, any final words for our uh, loyal audience? No, just thank you so much for the invitation today and, and for everyone joining. And I hope we can talk again soon. Yeah, likewise. Okay, have a good day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.